Okay. Let's have a look at the density pattern. This, this, I'm going to focus on the R11 solution, which is the twisted one. This has a density pattern at large distance. What does this density pattern look like? Well, it turns out it can be factorised. It's some function of r times some function of theta times some function of phi. As you could probably see by inspection of this, of this equation, it's a sum of spherical vessel functions. This is what they look like. Phi r, which is the radial component, at large distance, the best spherical vessel function looks like 1 over r sine r or 1 over r cos r. And these are two orthogonal components. I think this one follows just by inspection. There's e to the minus i n theta or e to the plus i n theta are two orthogonal components of the, sorry, phi, in the phi direction around there. And in the theta direction, of course, if I'm sitting out here, <coughs> because of the twist, what happens is this one gives me a propagating wave that is propagating in the plus theta direction. And on the far side, I'm getting a propagating wave that's propagating in the opposite direction. So I'm writing it like this. I can write the solution at large distance as a, as a linear sum of these solutions. I said I'd only ever write down classical equations, I'm still only writing <coughs> down classical equations. It may be observed that that is true. These are the Pauli spin matrices. These things because they have a twist at small distance, then at large distance, this twist and this rotation translates into spinner half symmetry at large distance, which is something that's normally associated with particles, like the electron, for example. And I think it's fairly easy to see if you just d phi by dr. Um, if I took, this is one of the eigenvectors. There's another eigenvector with a minus there, for example, with minus, minus the eigenvalue. Turns out, well, I won't go into the Dirac equation. This is re inherently related to something called the sorry, Dirac equation. Yes. What is that a chi you've got there? Or what? In the sorry. second equation? Oh, sorry, I meant, I meant that. Sorry, yes, that should be okay. phi. Yeah. Yes. Phi is phi r, phi theta, phi phi. Does that mean anything? Well, to a particle physicist it might mean something interesting. It has spinner half symmetry, which means that if you rotate it around a full circle, its sign re changes to minus one, which is a weird, weird phenomenon. It, as a fluid dynamicist, it probably wouldn't make much uh, relevance, but it may be relevant to those of you who are interested in quantum mechanics. So I'm emphasize I'm not writing down any quantum mechanical equations here. These are the equations of completely classical motion. Oh, I apologize, but I got lost. What, what are the b's? Uh, b, are, b is, for example, is, is just a linear, uh, uh, linear constants. So I'm saying it's a sum of a phi r. Might be, b might be 1 naught or naught 1 or a half. 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, or something. <clears throat> okay. Let's have a look at the equations of motion. How do these things move through the fluid? Well, before we go into this, let's look at an experimental analogue. I showed you a R1 naught quasi-particle earlier, where the density pattern looks, the, the disturbance, looks very much like these surface waves here that you can see on the surface of a, of a fluid. 
And I've just drawn this particle here just for illustration. It doesn't, it's not really there. It's just to show where, where it happened. But in the case of Yves Coudet, Yves Coudet in his Paris laboratory has done some experiments where he takes a bath of liquid and bounces it up and down at about 50 hertz or 60 hertz or so. And he induces a little droplet of the liquid to bounce on it. And of course, this, this droplet creates waves and it interacts with the waves. Let me just say up front, this is very similar. It actually obeys almost exactly the same equations as those of a sonon, uh, which is what I call them. It's a, but there are some differences. This is a two-dimensional driven <coughs> dissipative system rather than one without any dissipation. And there are some, the droplet itself does not obey Euler's equation. And I really do want the sound to work now. I guess by switching it on. So here is a video. Okay. Why, why, why not just unplug the sound lead from your laptop and listen, let us listen to the laptop speaker? I know why. The drop never touches the liquid of the substrate, so they're always separated by air film. And it all begins here with a drop of silicon. In his Paris laboratory, physicist Yves Coudet and his team conduct an amazing series of experiments. They are observing the behavior of silicon droplets bouncing in lockstep on a vibrating plate. The liquid of the drop never touches the liquid of the substrate, so they're always separated by air film. And in fact, this is stable. You can keep the drop bouncing on the liquid surface for several days if you wish. Using a camera that shoots a thousand frames per second, Coudet has discovered that these droplets mimic behavior seen in the quantum world. And that shouldn't be possible, because the quantum world and the large-scale world play by two different sets of rules. Yet, here we see a single droplet moving randomly like a quantum particle, but behaving like a quantum wave. If you watch this carefully, you'll notice that the wave appears to be guiding the droplet. In fact, the wave fields around the droplets develop a memory of the trails they have followed. Despite their random behavior, they follow a small number of paths. Again, this is eerily similar to the behavior of quantum objects. This runs so contrary to popular belief that at first, Coudet refused to believe what he was seeing. In the any physics experiments, you only see what you are prepared to see. Of course, this was very obvious that there was a memory, but it took us some time to realize that it was that that we were observing, because you have to adapt to this uh, new idea. Perhaps most revealing of all, Coudet has reproduced the double slit experiment using his bouncing silicon droplets. The mystery of quantum mechanics is, how can things like electrons sometimes behave like particles and sometimes behave like waves? Perhaps this is the answer. They are particles and waves. Of course, this system though small, is not quantum. Our system is not a model of quantum mechanics, but it is an association of a particle and a wave, and some of its properties are similar to the properties that are observed in quantum mechanics. Coudet won't claim that his experiments show us what is really <laughs> happening down at the deepest layers of existence. Let's 
see if we can understand this behaviour, which I want to emphasise is completely classical. So on quasi-particle A e to the minus i omega naught t, because it's the, the, the very similar equations for the drop of the drop that's bouncing up and down that hanging frequency omega naught, times some function of x. And we saw that this function has what's called spin and half symmetry at large distance, like an electron. Of course, when A is small, comes back to your question, the thing that is the wave equation. And as every physicist knows, the wave equation is unchanged by a Lorentz transformation. In this case, a Lorentz transformation with the speed of sound. That is, if I take d2, well, you probably know that. This means that if xi of x and t is a solution, then so is xi of x prime t prime, where x prime is gamma t minus x minus b c b t and so on. This, new, this other solution moves at velocity v, and it has suffered a Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction, as you see in special relativity. That's fine at low amplitude. Is it true at larger amplitude? Well, it's not quite true, but it's very, very nearly true. There are, I've focused on the largest perturbation. The other perturbations have a, the same effect, actually. It's perturbed by this non-linear term. If I add a, if I make the thing move at constant velocity v, I get this perturbation. Epsilon is v dot gradu. But as someone is oscillatory, and it turns out this perturbation vanishes over a cycle, average of it over a cycle. And of course, these, if you're measuring over long distances, um, you won't disturb it. Now, usually you define in quantum mechanics what's called an expectation value which converges on the long term average. And therefore, the motion of these things are Lorentz covariant at all amplitudes. They obey the postulates of special relativity in their analogue of the where the speed of sound is the speed of light. This is observed. I met Yves Coudé and said, well, what happens when these things... What, what happens is, if you increase the amplitude, if you increase the amplitude of the motion, then what happens is the droplet bounces higher. And because it bounces higher, it's got longer to longer time of flight, and so its frequency reduces. You could say it's redshifted. And the velocity, these things become what he calls a walker. They move along at a given velocity. And he has this equation. And I said to him, do you realize that this is the time dilation formula in special relativity? You can just rearrange it to the time dilation formula. So this is observed. Excuse me, is this the speed of sound in the, uh, the, the fluid or the, the air above the fluid? Well, in this case, it's in fact, the, the, there's a C prime here. What actually happens is, there's, I'm talking about the speed of sound for surface waves here. Okay. Now, actually, there's a complication, which is that very near the droplet, which is the bit you're actually interested in, you've got the weight of the droplet and you've got lots of nonlinear terms and things. So actually, he, he observes a, a, a different, different characteristic speed, which he calls C prime, which is about a quarter to a tenth of C. So that, this is one of the principal differences from sonons, which wouldn't have this, this effect. It's due to the And this is the reference, fascinating reference. 